Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this Friday uh, on, in honor of Veterans Day today. Really thrilled to be joining you all. Um, for those that, that don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Mark Hurlbert. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Melanoma Research Alliance and really thrilled to be joined today uh, by Andrew Smith, who will introduce himself in a moment. Um, I, it's a real honor for me to be here today with you, Andrew. I'm from a long uh, family history of veterans, including my dad was a Marine, uh, my brother was in the Air Force. I have uh, a nephew in the Army and a, and a niece who's just re recently re uh, promoted to major in the Arm and in the Air Force. So uh, we we joke that we could cover the whole Joint Chiefs of Staff, <laughs> but really honored to be with you, Andrew. Um, I think I'll just show um, a couple data points and then we'll let Andrew uh, introduce himself on the next slide. So for those of you that don't know about the Melanoma Research Alliance, uh, we have a mission to end suffering and death due to melanoma uh, by advancing the world's most promising research. Um, we have invested 150 million towards melanoma research since we were founded. And this has supported 425 projects um, at institutions, uh, cancer centers, hospitals, and universities all over the United States and around the globe. Um, as well, we've helped invest in 58 clinical trials and been a part of 16 amazing new drugs and treatments approved in the last decade. This is resulting in thousands of patients' lives saw, uh, saved. Uh, these advances in melanoma research have spilled over to help patients with other cancers. Many of the treatments first approved in melanoma are now benefiting patients with other types of cancers. Almost 30 other types of cancer now can use the, some of the same treatments. Uh, the next slide. And today we're going to talk about melanoma in the veteran population. Uh, melanoma and other skin cancers is a silent threat to the military and veteran community. Um, melanoma is the fourth among veterans, the fourth most common form of cancer diagnosed in veterans. And also veterans are more often diagnosed at advanced stages. And this is because uh, most melanoma is caused by sun exposure. Um, it's what we call cutaneous melanoma from the sun that we get on our on our exposed skin, our face and bodies when we're outdoors without sun protection. So thrilled to in introduce uh, Andrew Smith, who's gonna join us in a conversation about uh, melanoma in the veteran community and share his personal story. So Andrew, why don't we start off with you introducing yourself? Hey, thanks, Mark. First off, I'm, I'm thankful to be able to, to spend some time talking to you today, and I, I really appreciate everything that you guys do. But yeah, like Mark said, my name is Andrew Smith. Um, I served in the United States Army. I was infantry with 10th Mountain, and I deployed to Fallujah, Iraq in 2003 and 2004. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service to our country and keeping us safe. And uh, so I wanted to ask a little bit about your melanoma diagnosis. Can you just uh, share your story? I know you've, you've done this with us before, but why don't you tell the viewers uh, what happened, how you how you how you were diagnosed, and sort of what you've gone through so far? Yeah, so it wasn't um, it was nothing really remarkable where I would wanted to go to the doctor and get seen for it. Um, it was just a very small spot uh, spot on my nose that my wife kept saying, hey, you, sh you should get that checked out. You should get that checked out. And I, and I ignored her for a little while. And finally, I, I had a physical at the local VA hospital. And I asked my doctor, I was like, hey, my wife keeps wanting me to get this checked out. Uh, do you think it's anything? And he looked at it and he's like, no, I, I don't think it's anything. He's like, do we need to get somebody to like biopsy it? Like what's going to make your wife happy? And I was like, yeah, let's let's if we can talk to dermatology or something like that's probably going to to get her to, to stop bothering me about it. And so they did a biopsy of it. And again, it was a very small, um, like a mole, and it came back as melanoma. And so that wow. was in that was in August of 2020. And um, so we we're kind of COVID was going on, but they got me in pretty quickly. And back by October, they were doing my surgery. And that's where they did, I guess, the wide local excision. And they were able to um, to get everything. It was deeper than they uh, first expected, but it hadn't spread. They they took like seven sections of my lymph nodes, but it, it had not uh, spread to the lymph nodes yet. Wow. Well, maybe I'll, uh, I'll summarize a little bit. So you had a spot on your nose. Thankfully, your wife uh, uh, got you to talk to the doctor about it. I'm glad she did. Glad you talked to the doctor. 
Uh, they did a biopsy, found out it's it's melanoma, thankfully a, a thin earlier stage melanoma. And we're able to do a surgical procedure on your nose, which is called wide local excision. They, they you want to explain what you know about it? They took some skin from other parts of the body, right, to help. Yes, they ended up taking um, some skin from my neck, and that's what they kind of made my nose back <laughs> as uh, that wide local excision. They just yeah make sure they get good margins where they they get all the cancer. And the doctor that did my surgery, he did a, a remarkable job. Well, it looks great. Great work for the surgeons. And uh, you know, you look great today and glad you're recovered. And um, what was it like uh, being diagnosed during the COVID pandemic, during the height of it in, in 2020? Yeah, life, I mean, life for all of us during that time was just very strange. And then getting a cancer diagnosis in the middle of that just kind of made it even, even more strange. And then, um, as everybody knows, we all had to wear masks during that time. But uh, with a fresh skin graft, I couldn't wear a mask. And so I'm trying to to abide by all the COVID stuff, but then also yeah, deal with the issues that come along with with treating the cancer. Yeah, you've you've been we're, we're you went through a lot, and but glad glad to hear you're doing well. And thank you, you know, for sharing your story. I think it's really important for other veterans, other people still in the military on active duty, to hear your story and hear what you've gone through. Um, but maybe we could talk a little bit about sort of, you know, uh, melanoma. Again, most most melanomas are caused by, uh, you know, sun damage, UV sun exposure on our skin. And you've worked with uh, MRA in the past. We've shared a little bit about your story. But do you want to talk about sort of um, sun sun safety and sort of, uh, you know, what, what your practices were in the past versus what they are now after your diagnosis? Yeah, so I grew up as a kid in the, the 80s and 90s, and I, I joked before when I talked with you guys, I don't think I wore a shirt like the first 18 years of my life. <laughs> if, if we were outside, our shirt was off, and uh, nothing against my parents or any other parents during that time, but we just really did not consider that. When, once you had a little bit of a tan, you thought you were good to go, but um, as we learn more about that, you realize that's that's not the case, that the, the darker that tan keeps getting, that's just more... Um, damage from the sun and you're opening yourself up for for just a lot of issues in the future and so yeah now, now my approach i still love going to the beach i went this morning with my daughter but our our number one priority before going to the beach this morning was we're away from home right now i was like we, we have to find some sunscreen like it's it's like 87 degrees this morning and none of the shops were open and so we finally we didn't know where else to go we made it to the beach and i was like well somebody's gonna have sunscreen and we started asking so many people that were laying out in the sun at the beach, hey, do you have some sunscreen we could use? And nobody had it. Finally, we found this one grandfather who was putting sunscreen on his granddaughter. And he, he was the first one that we saw uh, with sunscreen. We were able to borrow some of his. But that has become a priority for us um, if we're going to to be exposed to the sun like that. Yeah, and no, I think you, you raise a really important point. You know, It's important to practice sun safety. You know, at the Melanoma Research Alliance, we encourage people to wear, um, you know, sun sunblock and sun lotion, SPF 30 or higher, you know, reapply it every couple of hours, especially if you go into the water on the beach when you come out, but on a fresh coat. And it's really important to practice sun safety. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I think that's a great a great role model now that, you know, you, you went through your own journey a, a couple of years ago, um, but now, now uh, and it's great to sort of experience explain and model the behavior with your daughter so going out and seeking that sunblock now have, has your yourself or your daughter or your children use any of the uh sun safe clothing the sun protective uv clothing yes we travel quite a bit and so we spent time um in curacao honduras uh different places and we definitely and again that was not a priority for us before but it, it definitely is now mm, understood and now I'll circle back a little bit in the military. So, you know, one one or two bad sunburns when you're in your teenage years, which uh, I also had, uh, same, same same era as you, I'm probably a little older than you, but ran around outdoors in the 70s and 80s without wearing sunblock. But, you know, just one bad sunburn, you know, in your teenage years can set you up at risk for melanoma later on in your life. And this is especially an acute issue in the military. And you want to describe about uh, you know your time in the military and, and being outdoors and were you even able to access sunscreen back then? Yeah, so being in the infantry, we were outside pretty much all, all of our deployment in Iraq. And um, 
just spent so many times on on patrol when you weren't in the, the vehicle you were you were out on foot exposed to the sun and given we had the long sleeve uniforms and stuff but if you were doing certain jobs that that jacket would come off you would just be in a t-shirt and i remember um vaguely being issued like a small like tube of sunscreen at some point but when you're packing all your gear going to combat that's that's not really high on the list of things that you think are most important so i don't think that that sunscreen was ever opened by me and i never saw anyone else um using theirs and then about halfway through our deployment to Iraq, we were given a three-day leave to a country called Qatar. And once we got to Qatar, which is right on the Persian Gulf, our shirts came off, we put swimming trunks on, and we stayed out in that sun all day. And that is the worst sunburn that I've ever gotten um, because we'd had our shirt on for six months, and then you take it off. And, I mean, it was it was bad. <laughs> um, and... So I'm no, I'm not the only guy that that did that, and a lot of people, their military duties just exposed them to long, um, a, a lot of time in the sun, and that's that's something I doubt that they were um, given sunscreen prepared for. Yeah, and I think it's an important point, and uh, I've I've talked with a few other veterans over uh, the last few weeks actually, and have heard uh, various things like they. Um, you know, they, they either don't recall or don't remember getting sunscreen when they were on active duty and definitely def definitely said, oh, I didn't apply any. I was just outdoors all day doing my job. And as you said, sometimes the, the jacket came off, the long sleeves came off, and they were just out getting a lot of sun exposure. I'm curious, you know, during the pandemic, uh, you know, across the military, really, and across society, we put out the, you know, the hand sanitizer little pumps everywhere, right? You know, you'd walk that. Yeah. You know, at the front door of your grocery store or the local Walmart or Target, you know, there'd be some hand sanitizer. And I assume the same has ha happened across facilities at, at, uh, in military facilities. Do you think that there'd be an opportunity to, you know, be more promotion of using sunscreen if it was uh, more broadly, more visible, you know, to the military community? Yeah, I think it's just an educational thing because the military does so many things and takes so many steps to protect their their soldiers and the the safety briefings they give, um, the the planning that goes into missions. Uh, I think it's just again the educational side of training the military. Here's what you need to be doing, an additional step to protect your soldiers, Marines, and and everybody that's serving. So I, I definitely think that that's, that's needed. Uh, the amount of skin cancer that has went through just the guys that I've served with is really mind-blowing. And there was um, one of my friends that I served with last week. He had his surgery to remove um, skin cancer, and, and thankfully they were able to get everything. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's really an important thing. I think I really appreciate your, you know, talking with us today. I think this is a good starting point to really – begin educating more the military community and the veteran community. Um, and just for all the viewers, you know, if, if you're not familiar, you know, skin cancers, there's about 2 million cases diagnosed across the U.S. every year, a lot of it in the veteran and military population. Uh, the most common types of skin cancer are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, which uh, I, I've had a couple of those uh, removed from, from one from my face, one from my shoulder. And it's really common, like I said, a few million cases a year. And those usually can be caught early. Um, melanoma is the third most common type of skin cancer, but it's also the deadliest. And that's what Andrew uh, has shared with us, had, had one diagnosed on his nose. And um, we really encourage people to you know, know uh, the spots on your body, especially as you get older, uh, know what moles you have and see if there's any new ones that pop up. Um, we talk about the rules of A, B, C, D, E, but if it's changing color or growing in diameter or size or evolving in any way, um, then definitely get that looked at by your doctor. And there are parts of your body, like the, like your back, you can't see there. So definitely have your spouse or your family member or friends, you know, look at, at anything um, on your back or parts of the body you can't see yourself. But really great, Andrew, that your wife sort of saw that spot on your nose, caught it, uh, encouraged you to talk to your doctor about it, and that your doctor followed up. That's really remarkable. So we're going to open the floor to any questions from the audience. Uh, but in earlier discussions with Andrew, he asked me what what is MRA doing related to uh, melanoma in the veteran community and thought I'd share a minute on that. And um, one one exciting project that we're leading, um, I'm actually the, the lead of a team project 
and we're working closely with the Veterans Administration, the VA Hospital in Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. But it's a national study. Um, it's the Melanoma Research Alliance, the VA system, and we're working with Harvard Mass General Hospital. And we're looking at uh, the risk factors for melanoma among the veteran population. Of course, we know sun exposure is one of the main risk factors, but there are other rare subtypes of melanoma. Um, one that occurs in your eye called uveal melanoma, um, one that occurs on the inside of your, your nose and mouth um, on the moist tissues of your body called mucosal. And then this other rare subtype that occurs on the bottom of your foot or the palm of your hand, which obviously those don't, don't get a lot of sun exposure called acromelanoma. And so we're leading a project with the VA uh, team out of Boston and Providence, but it's looking at the whole Veterans Administration and across the whole country. And um, we're doing some, some analysis of what are the risk factors, especially for these rare subtypes. And it's really an exciting project. We're just really getting underway. Uh, we presented some preliminary work earlier this week at the Society for Melanoma Research, a big conference that's just ended yesterday. It was in Philadelphia. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll report back on that more down the road. Um, I think a question has come in. <clears throat> Uh, how does early detection play a part in veterans' outcomes? Um, why don't I answer that from the medical side? And then, Andrew, why don't you talk about early detection? So from, from your perspective, I would say what's critical, again, is to know your body, know any uh, moles or spots, uh, know your body and know any moles or spots. And especially if anything new pops up, then definitely you need to have that looked at. Ask your primary care doctor. <laughs> or uh, a medical health clinic to look at it, ask the VA to look at it when you're next on your next VA appointment. Um, but uh, most often the doctor will refer you to a dermatologist that will help in, in detecting it. Um, dermatologists have a special device they call a dermatoscope. It's basically like a special light with a special magnifying glass and they can you know look at your skin with this dermatoscope and it helps them look a few millimeters under the surface of the skin. Um, so that's how early detection is most often done, but it's really knowing your body and knowing spots that are changing. But Andrew, what, what about it from your patient perspective? What do you talk about early detection among veterans? What would you want all your comrades to know? Yeah, it's, it's honestly, like you said, just taking the time to pay attention to those things, to the changes and, and for the spots that you can't see having um, somebody in your life that, that can keep track of that for you. And then after my diagnosis, that that's when you start having a lot more um, appointments where they're they're checking out your skin and looking for those things. But you still have to do that that on your own as well. And um, I mean, having a diagnosis, that that's the wake up call that encourages you to do that. But early detection is key. So don't if you're watching this right now, don't wait for that wake up call. Start uh, start keeping track of that now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Another question, it's more of a comment, but a question that uh, that we both could respond to, Andrew, perhaps. But uh, the, the person wrote that having they, they've accompanied their father to many primary care appointments at the VA, and they sort of feel like there's not a lot of attention paid to skin health. I've even heard from from some vets, yeah, they don't even have me take my shirt off. They never look at my feet or or my skin, you know. Um, so how can we get more uh, skin health checks by the VA? Any thoughts from your side, Andrew, on on getting uh, the docs to look at you your, your skin? No, I think any government organization that big is going to fail in a lot of ways. <laughs> so it's not, this isn't me just bashing the VA. I think they have a very difficult job to do, but they do drop the ball. Um, and in a lot of ways, I know a lot of VA hospitals right now, they they can't keep uh, dermatologists on, on staff. So even if you are going for a, a skin check, it's not with someone that's necessarily trained specifically to look for things. And so I think it's just being your own advocate. And one thing the VA has done well lately is the community programs um, that allow you to access care in your community. So I think it's it's making sure that you're taking advantage of um, civilian providers that you have access to as well. Absolutely, and and I agree with you, no bashing of, of the VA or any system. Um, you know, they have a lot of work to do. They're taking care of your heart and your mental health and any other issues you have. But the skin is is, is an important uh, part. And I think you 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 gave the best answer, Andrew. It's you have to be your own advocate and really ask the doctor to to examine you. And whether that's at your VA appointment or whether it's uh, you know, like you said in the private care. But um, I think it's a critical thing. On the research front, you know, the Melanoma Research Alliance we're funding a fair amount of research to bring 
hopefully bring new tools to help people in examining their own moles. Um, it's it's not ready for prime time, you know, yet today, but I think down the road, we hope to have like even an app on your phone that could be medically validated where you could take a picture and transmit it to dermatologists to review sort of what we call teledermatology, telehealth. Um, it's done today uh, for, for some minor rashes and things, but for my, diagnosing melanoma, it's obviously a very critical thing. And so it's still a work in progress on getting the best artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms. There are other tools and devices in development. So some dermatology practices utilize, especially in high risk patients, and Andrew, you might be a candidate for this down the road, they do what's called total body photography. And I tell people, you, it's kind of like going through the TSA screening at the airport. You stand <laughs> you know, with your whole body you know, exposed and um, they, they have uh, uh, cameras that go all around your body and take pictures of all of your moles. And if you do those over time, especially again in, in melanoma survivors or high risk patients, um, then the AI can actually spot changes in those photographs and those moles over time, even better than the human eye can. So, you know, new devices, new technologies beyond derm dermoscopy is one area of research. Adding AI and machine learning is another. And then um, again, we're working on research that will help bring apps to patients, hopefully at some point. Today, I encourage my family and friends, don't don't allow, don't download any of the apps that are out there today. They're not yet ready for prime time. They're not approved by the FDA. So work with your dermatologists and doctors about how best to track your moles and skin health. Um, someone asked about the results from our research. Uh, nothing to share today. We'll report back probably next spring. We'll, we'll have another follow-up webinar and talk about some of the risk factors we're finding beyond sun, sun exposure and sunburn in the military population. I think... Uh, just looking at the question queue, I think that's it for now uh, for questions. Anything else, Andrew, you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up today? Um, sometimes veterans aren't that good at, at helping themselves out. So I, I encourage you, if you have a, a veteran in your life, um, encourage them to, to remember this is something that they need to, to do in their life to take care of themselves so they can be there to, to continue serving um, their families, friends, and um yeah, just just be here for us. I'm I'm very thankful that my wife um, took the time. She loved me enough to to kind of push me to to get checked. So make sure you're doing that for those that are in your life. I I can't think of a better way to end it. I think that's the great message that Andrew just shared. Uh, veterans, be an advocate for all of us listening that are the family and friends and loved ones of veterans. Uh, honor your veteran today. Support them and encourage them to get their skin checked and understand the risk factors for melanoma and to practice sun safety. Andrew, I hope. You and your family have some fun to, there on the beach and uh, be sure to wear your sunscreen and some of your sun protective clothing. Have a great uh, Veterans Day weekend and thank you so much for your time today, Andrew. It's great to be with you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I enjoyed it.